next segment is a panel of business leaders and advocates that are going to describe <clears throat> firsthand their journeys to their roles as advocates for carbon price, carbon fee, carbon fee and dividend, and other climate issues. Uh, to moderate the group, Citizens Climate Lobby and Business Climate Leaders is glad to introduce Pete Marsh, uh, founder of Vector Green Power, a small solar design and installation firm in Long Beach, California. Take it away, Pete. Hey, good morning. Thanks, Kyle. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody out there. Um, and thanks to Danny and Mark and Representative Peters for a fantastic intro and start. I'm just delighted and humbled to be here serving this great audience and, uh, and this great panel. My solar business is a third career for me, uh, a favorite after two great earlier careers, 25 years of Coast Guard active duty, 10 years in defense contracting. As I was transitioning into solar, uh, I was doing it for to help the climate and I was looking for a group that could help me refine and amplify my voice as an active advocate. And when I knew I learned when I learned about CCL, I knew I had found it. Then a year ago, uh, I found BCL and boom, I, I feel like I'm punching way above my weight class when I work with people like this panel and all of you. Um, and we, we understand uh, many of us have understood the importance of business involvement uh, and Danny just reinforced it brilliantly in his presentation. So um, our three panelists today, Mike Milkey is with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. He's their head of public policy. And the part of the title that I really love is Senior Vice President of Climate. Uh, he's been there 13 years, loves advocating on behalf of SVLG's 350 member companies, which range from venture-backed startups in the proverbial garage uh, to five of the world's seven largest publicly traded companies by market cap. So uh, quite a bit of uh, a por portfolio there, Mike. Uh, Joseph Brinkley is with Fetzer Vineyards and uh, they, Fetzer was established in 1968. It's headquartered in Hopland, California and Fetzer Vineyards is a leading US marketer of wines and spirits uh, with a focus on creating uh, crafting wines made from sustainable, organic, and biodynamic grapes. And they're the largest winery in the United States to be named a certified B Corporation. So Joseph is Fetzer Vineyards' head farmer and a recognized leader in regenerative wine growing. Uh, and finally, Geraldine Link is Director of Public Policy for the National Ski Areas Association, which represents over 300 member resorts in 37 states, they account for more than 90% of the skier and snowboarder visits nationwide. Geraldine points out that the skiing industry has been concerned about climate change since long before many others and may in fact be uh, the canary in the coal mine for other industries. So two of our panelists spent a good part, spend a good part of their time advocating on behalf of their member companies. And the uh, one whose title is head farmer probably well represents the other end of the spectrum, uh, perhaps closer to where many members of our audience would place ourselves. Uh, I'll mention very briefly that while we in Citizens Climate Lobby often use the term lobbying to describe our own work because our group proudly uses that work as a self descriptor, but to differentiate that we are not K Street uh, rich lobbyists, we are citizens. But Geraldine and Mike, both uh, a lot of people would think they are professional lobbyists, but they actually don't, they are not registered lobbyists in the sense required by the federal government. Uh, so they uh, also like us are advocates. So anyway, welcome everybody. Uh, to open up, I I'd like to start with Geraldine and Mike. Uh, many of the small and business leader, small and medium business leaders out there may find ourselves in an intimidated by the idea of engaging members of Congress. When you started out as an advocate, were you similarly uncomfortable? What can you suggest that would help other business leaders expand our comfort zones when talking to legislators? So I'll jump in here, um, if that's okay. And I would say, you know, I perhaps was a bit intimidated um, at the start because Washington can be an intimidating place but one of the things that I like to tell my members is that members of Congress really want to hear from you. Um, you employ maybe tens or hundreds or thousands of people in their district or in their state. And um, more than anything, they wanna know what's going on in the trenches and they wanna hear your story. I think that's something that you'll hear from this panel a lot today. Um, when a Skiria from California, for example, shares that its property 
insurance premiums quintupled in one year due to wildfire risks, their representative is going to hear that. And they're even going to repeat that story. It's going to make a mark and it will, you know, be with them when they're thinking about future legislation. That's great. And, uh, and what a great story. Mike, how about you? Yeah, I think Geraldine knocked it out of the park. I, I would just, I would just uh, say that what they want to do is they want to hear from the job creators and they want to hear what is either going to help or what is going to hurt the job creators and mm -hmm. you know the folks that underpin a vast portion of the U.S. economy and that's small and medium-sized enterprises. And whenever possible, uh, they want to hear directly from the executives that run these businesses, right? Um, and the stories, that's what they want to know. They, they don't want to get into the ins and outs of the various uh, merits or issues in regards to the policy. Leave that to the staff. They want to know top line stuff that they can go forward with that they'll remember. And it really is, as Geraldine said so well, the stories. Uh, and, and trying to make it as approachable as possible. That's great, thank you both. Um, and I know you both spend a fair amount of time uh, in your day jobs talking to members of Congress and their staffs about the importance of carbon fee and dividend. How often do your members of your organizations join you in these conversations? So, so oh, okay. go ahead, Mike. No, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, I would say our members chime in a fair bit. Um, they're very busy running their operations and I completely respect that. But when, it, when there's an issue that NSA needs help on, they're very generous with their time and, and willing to you know, make the trip to DC. And, and that is quite a commitment. Um, but I can tell you that when you do have a CEO with you in a meeting, you get more time with that representative or that Senator and their staff um, a lot more time. And so I think it's just critical that the businesses are the voice um, in DC. And of course, um, you know, the government affairs team at, a, at an association can help facilitate those opportunities for businesses, but it's really critical that the business be the voice in Washington. Again, she knocked it out of the park. I'm just gonna say ditto. <laughs> she covered all the bases whenever possible. Um, I mean, you know, as, as advocates, that's our job. Our job is to do all the, the spade work, but whenever we really wanna drive home uh, a point or make a, 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 as big an impact as possible, it's putting our members and especially the, the member executives forward uh, to have those conversations. So it'll happen at key points during the year, right? And, it, and on key occasions or in key hearings or things like that. But otherwise, uh, all the spade work um, that goes on in between that is uh, up to uh, Geraldine and I. Awesome, thank you. Um, so now, uh, Joseph, I certainly haven't meant to leave you out. Uh, your job title and career path have been show a uh, deep involvement in operations and really farming operations, which feels maybe as far from the public policy realm to me as one can get, uh, although clearly dependent on public policy. Have, have you ever advocated for legislation uh, previous to this? Uh, and if so, how did you get started? And what then helped you decide to move beyond a fairly simple endorsement of the EICDA to becoming more, enga more engaged? Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, you're right. Uh, spent a lot of time in the field. Um, so, you know, at Fetzer Vineyards, though, we, we've had a long history of uh, sustainable regenerative type practices. And now more recently with climate advocacy has been a, a bigger focus of the, the business. Um, you know, as Geraldine mentioned, uh, I mean, we're, we're quite um, connected to climate change. You know, we've had big fires around us. Uh, the, the climate is directly impact, impacting our our business, uh, farming operations and such. And um, we've seen that it's a, a real and concerning risk to the business. Um, so we declared a climate emergency in 2020. You know, we've been committed to being climate, excuse me, climate positive um, in our total operations by 2030. So really this 
advocacy work um, and, and looking at policies as, as a, a price on carbon really kind of aligns with our, our need. And then it really helps us to move, move things forward. We've, we've done everything we can and are continuing to do more within our own business, you know, from our sourcing of energy to, to how we farm and such. But we really need partners uh, at the legislat legislative level to make policies that, you know, kind of go beyond what, what we can as, as a business do. Fantastic. That's great. And um, what led Fetzer Vineyards to decide to endorse carbon fee and dividend? What was that decision making process like internally amongst your leadership team? And do you have any lessons for the audience from that experience? Yeah, great. Pete. Thanks. Um, you know, I think it's really important, I think, just as a business kind of um, prerogative to to hire the best talent and to empower those people that you hire. Right. So we we have a head of sustainability. Um, and then so we we trust our people. We allow the people that we put into the position to gain the alignment they need from the leadership team. And then once we get the alignment, everybody's on board. We understand this is a really important thing. We move it forward. Um, so, you know, things like the, the wine industry climate declaration that was led by BCL, we sign on to. We just I think I guess the, the take home is to to empower your people, trust them, and then, uh, you know, gather the alignment from the top all the way around the table um, and move things forward. I mean, I, my background's in, my, my first degree is in economics, um, and I got into to farming as well. So, you know, putting a price, letting the market do its work, um, it, it works within our, our culture, kind of our, our society, our mentality, and, and it's incredibly effective, like Danny was mentioning. I mean, what a great outline there. And, and it's really important. I mean, we have to do something drastic like now. So this has been great. Super, thanks so much, Joseph. Um, so Geraldine and, and Mike, maybe Mike will let you go first this time. Uh, so uh, Geraldine gets to say ditto. Uh, You've now been doing this for some time, 13 years with SDLG. Now that you're a regular, um, do you find your advocacy work uh, experience uh, rewarding? Uh, any change in that level over time? Uh, talk to us about that intrinsic value. Yeah, thanks. I, I think it's just like anything else, right? So um, uh, practice, uh, the more you practice, the better you get. The more you do something, uh, hopefully over time, the better you get at it. Also, in terms of um, the the value for me um, is, you know, and why I've been doing this for so long, I do find it valuable. I do find this rewarding. And that's when you get wins, right? When you help uh, ensure that legislation, like uh, several years ago when California was looking to um, you know, continue its, its carbon cap and trade program, which the leadership group um, supports. Um, you know, when, when they were looking for uh, a critical vote, the two thirds vote in the legislature, we were very engaged on that. Uh, and considering that a win. In 2016, we worked on a regional measure across the nine county Bay Area. The first measure ever of its kind where uh, uh, a region in the United States decided to tax itself to deal with climate adaptation. Um, that's a high hurdle to get two thirds of a region as diverse and populous as the Bay Area to support that, but we did. So um, I, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I have a, a number of those wins to point to um, because you don't win all the time, right? Uh, and you win some and you lose some, but I've been fortunate enough to be part of wins at both the regional and the state level and now, fingers crossed, let's get a win at the at the federal level and make something big happen. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Geraldine, how about you? I am tempted to just say ditto, but I'm gonna I'm gonna branch off in a little different direction. So um, I would say my longevity at an SAA has given me a lot of perspective. And it took me a long time to realize that connecting with someone across the table from you in the policy realm is critical. It's, it's way more important than wowing them with your impressive grasp of the facts. And I would say I'm um, the kind of person who came out of law school with the I'm right, 
you're wrong mentality. And um, that doesn't always work out well in the policy realm. And I would say that what, what time has, has taught me is that if you put yourself in somebody else's shoes, if you take the time to see the humanity in that other person across the table from you, uh, to quote the late John McCain, you have a shot at connecting and finding a path forward and a path forward that's actually durable you know, and will last. And I think that that is what my long time in, in this role at NSA has taught me. And um, I think it's really important to this climate discussion. I've learned so much from CCL, honestly, with a constructive, bipartisan, respectful approach. And so I just wanna put in that plug, hats off to CCL for having that influence on all of us. But um, that's my perspective, having done this for a really long time. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you both so much. And now, uh, Joseph, uh, you're, you're newer to the game, but uh, how do you find the experience? Yeah, I, it's been fascinating, really. I mean, once again, Geraldine knocks it out of the park. It's really hard to follow Geraldine. I don't know why you <laughs> did this to me, but um, this is, this is uh, it, it's really, I mean, it, for one, it's fascinating, not an area of my study, you know, um, but having those connections. I mean, I, I was in a bunch of meetings a few years back with a, a series group, you know, and, and we're meeting with both sides of the aisle. And, and sometimes it's, I, I enjoy the, the, the side that you think isn't going to be on board, you know, because there's a bit of a challenge. I appreciate the challenge. And, and really, we're, we're trying to, to move something forward and, and maybe bring a new perspective or a new paradigm and, and, and connecting on a point that they feel is important to their constituents, you know, because we're all, we're at the end of the day, no matter what, what side you're on, you, you really are trying to do what's best for what you feel is best for yourself and your children and those to come, you know, so really being able to connect. And um, I mean, it, it, it's a great experience, I think. And when you see that you, you struck a chord and somebody lights up and like you, you had an impact, you know, it, it's been really quite fascinating. And um, there's a lot of work to be done and, and we need kind of everybody on board one way or the other. Hey, fantastic, thank you very much. Um, so we're, let's see, um, over the years, legislators you know, consistently tell us as we've heard over and over already this morning from businesses in their district or their state. Uh, and we've talked a couple of times already about uh, sort of war stories uh, as I, or as we used to call it in the Coast Guard, sea stories. Uh, can you share any other specific examples when a business really seemed to make a positive impact on an elected official? And if you've already touched on it, you know, that's fine. We can take more questions at the end. I'm going to jump in. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> that way go I don't ahead. have to, I don't have to follow Geraldine. <laughs> 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 so uh, a couple years back, I, um, I had the opportunity to meet, meet with all of the agriculture committees from the both houses and from both sides of the aisle, if you will, you know, and we're really advocating for more uh, climate smart agriculture practices, because we feel like there's a, an incredible impact, not only to reduce uh, emissions, but really to start bringing the carbon from the atmosphere and, and put it into the soil where it's an incredible benefit. So we've done some studies, we've had some research um, that we've uh, commissioned and, and looking at that, how our farming practices really can move this, you know, this, this carbon issue that we're all facing and, and to be able to connect and more on a one on one basis with these committees and these members and to see that they're totally interested and they, they really like, like was already said, they want to hear your stories and they want to hear from you. Um, and to show that, you know, we've been farming this way and this is the results we've seen, but we also have research to back up all that we've been saying and just to have the eagerness of like, oh, can we see the study? Can we see the data? Like, you know, this is great information. And so you make those connections, like was already said, and, and you really feel like you're, you're going to have an impact on the, the upcoming farm bill. You know, you're really starting to move something that, that then has an incredible impact on the, on the nation, because then policy and funding is, is crafted based on them hearing your story of how you farm and, and the, the incredible positive impact that it has. Fantastic. Thanks. And uh, let's see, Mike, how about you? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's my job. So uh, there, there's there's just uh, 
all we try to do, as I said, is put forward our members in the right place at the right time to ha have conversations with the legislature, legislators because, or folks in the administration as the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, as we've all talked about, th these are the job creators. These are the folks that are responsible for, you know, a huge portion of the, of the you know, the uh, US economy. And so they wanna hear directly from them. So. Yes, every single time. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, at the end of the day, having me go in and talk to them is, is good, but having a business leader go in and talk to them is great. Like that's the different, it's a different level. It's a different order of magnitude. Thank you so much. Geraldine? Yeah, I could not agree more um, with Mike. And I would say, um, I've got just a, a brief story about um, a, a encounter, let's say, between a, a member of Congress and a CEO in the ski industry. And this is back in 2019. And as Danny Richter pointed out in his wonderful presentation, we've really come a long way in the last two years on um, engaging Republicans in Congress on climate change. And so back in 2019, Representative Scott Tipton, who represents the um, Western Slope of Colorado, or did at the time. He's a Republican. He invited um, the CEO of Telluride Ski Area, Bill Jensen, to come and be part of a field hearing on wildfire risks. And Bill Jensen said, I will come to this hearing on wildfire risks, but if we're gonna talk about wildfire, we have to talk about climate change too. We can't leave that out of the discussion. They're, they're inextricably linked. And Representative Tipton at the time said, okay, I, I will let you talk about that and we'll expand the scope of, of this field hearing, which was a big deal at the time. And um, so Bill Jensen made that trip to um, Durango and talked at that, that field hearing. And then four months later, Representative Tipton, who's the co-chair of the Ski Caucus in Congress, decided to have the first ever climate change roundtable of the ski caucus and i've been you know working with that caucus for 20 years and we've never had a a round table that was only on climate change and so it was a really big deal and the first person who representative tipton invited to come to that round table was bill jensen from telluride so i think that's how this goes those those small steps turn into bigger conversations trust um and and you know good things come from that. So that was just a, a great impact that I witnessed. And it really um, energizes me to, to find more of those kind of opportunities. Wow, I got all tingly. That was <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I think my last question, uh, I think we've really pretty much covered it already. But uh, if you have any final words, let's go ahead. Uh, and it goes back to the sort of the heart of the title of this panel. You know, why is it that businesses, especially small and medium, are so important to engaging members of Congress? Um, and if we've already covered it all, uh, feel free to just say so. Uh, but if you have any other tidbits, now's the time. And then we, I think we'll have time for some questions. Quick two points. Um... They often hear from the folks that I represent. They don't often hear from small and medium sized uh, business owners. So that's super impactful because it's not the usual crowd. And um, SMEs, let's face it, I think huge portion of the US economy, job creators, innovators, uh, it's, it's, it's the, uh, you know, it's such a driving dynamic force in the US economy. And because of that, um, they have they have a bigger microphone than maybe they realize. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, and Joseph? I couldn't agree oh. more. Um, I was just going to say, small and medium businesses are the heart of the American economy, and members of Congress can and will go to bat for you. Um, even a, like a small ski area is a major economic driver in a rural community. So that business really matters to members of Congress. And um, they, they, again, they, they do want to hear from you. All right, Joseph, bring us home. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think it's important that the businesses of our size, they're we're really aligned with grassroots advocacy. You know, we're, we're 
we're providing jobs in the community where the legislatures are, are representing. You know, we, we have the the money in, the money out. The people are our people are living there, working there, playing there. Um, so in this way, it really kind of strikes home is more of like a personal feel for it. You know, we we definitely do advocacy work on the uh, alongside larger corporations on the federal level as well, you know, but all the way from the, the local to the state and, and up, it, it's really helpful, I think, to see us show up and represent and know that, you know, this is your community too, that you're representing and, and this is what we need and this is kind of what's impacting us and this is what will help us. Um, and, and I think it, it helps to kind of put that, you know, in, you know, the street that you live on, right? I mean, we're, we're really closely connected once you get to this kind of smaller scale like this. Um, I think we're just a foundation to the community, you know, um, smaller and medium-sized businesses. So, all right, fantastic. So, thank you all very, very much, Kyle. Um, that uh, brings us to the end of the sort of topics we wanted to cover. Do we have any questions? So we do have some questions, but one that is kind of recurring and I think is uh, kind of ties together to a lot of what has been said already, but I think we could boil it down just a little bit for um, our audience. Uh, for each of you, if, if we could run through each of you quickly, um, what are, you know, say two or three things that you think a smaller, medium-sized enterprise could do in the next, you know, six months while we feel like we have this window that would be most effective at, um, for them to kind of get their message across to their member? All right, I'm going for it. I, I think um, really to, you know, to align with, with groups like yourself, CCL, BCL, I mean, and, and so you, you clearly have experts, right? I mean, I, I still don't understand what Danny just said, but it was an amazing synopsis of how this all works, right? So you have people on the ground that know this stuff and, and we know that we're, fight, we're fighting the same fight, right? We're all trying to go in the same direction. So to really kind of align put your support behind these things. And then, I mean, I've, I've done my share of, you know, op-eds and such, you, you get a little bit of writing out there, you, you talk to folks and, and you really kind of get some momentum behind you that you can show that you care and that you're not going away, right? And you need the help of the kind of the policymakers. Hey, thanks, Joseph. Um, Geraldine, please. Yeah, so I would say you can go it alone, right? And do anything, write a letter, um, ask for a, a Zoom meeting. I think this virtual reality that we're all living in now has made um, access a little bit easier, you know, in, in wanting to get your message across to a member of Congress. So I think those are important routes and I think timing is key. And I, I really do feel like members need to hear from businesses now. Um, and then also you could team up, you know, you can join others broad coalitions, or even if, if it's just another business that has the same kind of, um, you know, frontline impacts that you might have from climate change. And, um, you know, together, maybe you'll be irresistible to a member of Congress. Um, just on this panel today, I've learned so much from these other, you know, business perspectives. So bring that with you, but, um, but do it now, I would say. I think that now is critical. Mike, how about you? Yeah, again, just ditto what Geraldine said, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, would, I would add on just uh, don't be afraid, reach out. Uh, make your voice heard. This is how democracy is supposed to work, right? Is, and these people represent you, right? They represent the, the, the citizens across this country. So reach out to your representative. It's a great place to start. Uh, be clear about what your message is, be clear uh, and concise and tell them again, tell, make, you know, uh, draw, draw the, the picture for them, bring the story home. And lastly, yes, strengthen numbers whenever possible, join with groups that you think uh, represent your interest and you feel uh, alignment with. Well, thanks so much, everybody. That, uh, that lands us right on time. So Mike, well done, perfect. <laughs> Um, but I thank you very much for your time today, guys. That was just a terrific, and I, I know we all learned a lot. Um, Pete, thank you for moderating. Uh